What a joy it is to worship with you on this third Sunday of Eastertide. Alleluia. I welcome you and particularly if there are any friends or extended family or newcomers who are joining us for worship. We would like to know of your presence with us. And if you are new, we invite you to please contact the church. Today, the congregation is gathering for virtual fellowship at 1130 a.m. Instructions for this can be found in the Sunday worship email or on the website. You and your pets are also invited to a blessing of animal service via Zoom at 4.30 this afternoon. Joyce, Alex, and I are so looking forward to blessing those animals who bless you each and every day. And so now, friends, let us worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. to be truth tellers, even when it is saying the way that we have fallen short and the ways that we have harmed ourselves in relationship to one another and to our God. So let us confess together, trusting in God's mercy. Almighty God, our view of the world is corrupt. We fail to see when power is disguised as truth, when convenience masquerades as goodness, when selfish pleasure imitates love. We confess to you, God, that we have been caught in the web of the world's sin and are complicit in it. By the power of the Holy Spirit, 
save us from these deceptions that blind and bind us. Free us to see the joy of Jesus' resurrection and to receive the promise of life anew in him. Amen. Friends, hear the sound of grace poured out. We worship a living Lord who comes alongside us when we recognize him and even when we do not and tells us again and again who God is, a God of love, of grace and of mercy. Friends, believe in the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. scriptures to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. You set their hearts ablaze. By the power of your spirit, kindle our hearts that we might pay attention to the truth you would reveal. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 14, and then continuing to verses 36 through 41. Listen with me for God's word to us today. But Peter Standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Therefore the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah. This Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you, for your children, 
and for all, all those far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were at it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson from scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke. I will read from chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Listen to the word of the Lord. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders had handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us they were at the tomb early this morning, and when they didn't find his body there, they came back and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is now almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Of all the stories in the gospel, the story of 
Two disciples walking and talking on the road to Emmaus is one of my favorites. It draws me in. Without much effort, I can relate to the scenario. I have known, and perhaps you have too, the need to discuss with another person, to process together an event that has turned your world so upside down that your worldview no longer makes sense. Without much effort, I can feel the weight of their words and the heaviness of their hearts as they head home from their annual Passover pilgrimage to the holy city, now a city of horrors. Returning to their homes, where they will likely pick up their fishing nets and try to resume their normal lives. It's a good thing that the distance between Jerusalem and Emmaus is some seven miles long. The time to walk and talk offers them an opportunity not just to review and confirm the nightmarish events that have taken place and not just to offer each other consolation, but also to encounter the resurrected Jesus. Interesting, isn't it, that the two disciples don't recognize him? I've wondered about this. How could it be that they wouldn't recognize the man whom they had left their former occupations to follow, their teacher, Lord and leader? How could they not recognize the very person they were missing? It is the height of irony. Maybe they would have recognized the Jesus they thought they knew. Something prevents them from recognizing this Jesus who is resurrected. Is it that his appearance has been physically altered? There's no indication of this. Is it instead that their misery has made their vision myopic? Are they so heartbroken that they have turned inward? Has all the drama of the past days completely clouded their vision? All of this is possible. When Jesus asks them what they are talking about, so immersed are they in their sorrow that they can't believe that someone wouldn't know what has taken place. They proceed to explain the series of events that led to Jesus's death. We know from what they say that they were in shock of how it all turned out. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel, they say. And there you hear it, the deepest part of their sorrow. Jesus hears them out. And you get the sense that he is patiently waiting to hear how they will talk about the news of his resurrection. And they do mention it, despite the sorrow they feel for his death and their disillusionment. They mention the puzzling report of the women who went to the tomb and found it empty and then were told by angels that Jesus had risen from the dead. They mention that hearing from the women that the tomb was empty a couple of the disciples went to the tomb and also found it empty, seeing that his disciples were still so sad instead of glad, were so focused on the death that they couldn't take in his resurrection. It seems as though Jesus is exasperated. Oh, how foolish you are, he says. After being publicly sentenced to death, nailed to a cross, buried in a tomb, after all he has been through, to be raised from the dead is so amazing, so life-changing. Why isn't that what everyone is talking about? Why isn't that what enables the disciples now to make sense of everything? of all that the prophets have taught and the scriptures have said. It's not unusual that we 
only see what we are looking for. In fact, it happens more often than we may be aware. There's a term for this. It is inattentional blindness. Berkeley University researchers Arian Mack and Irvin Rock coined this term in the 1990s while they were studying the difference in what people perceive when things lie inside and outside their fields of visual attention. Not surprisingly, they found that people are much less likely to pay attention to things that fall outside the area at which they are staring. What is surprising, however, is that people do detect certain things that fall outside the fields of their visual attention, while other things go unnoticed. In other words, some things get your attention, while other things do not. In her book, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy, Jenny O'Dell, the author, tells a story about attending a symphony performance at San Francisco's Davies Symphony Hall of pieces from John Cage's songbooks. The composer John Cage is known for his philosophy that everything we hear is music. Describing the performance of his piece, she writes, Instead of the customary rows of musicians dressed in all black, the people on stage were dressed in plain clothes, moving about various props and devices like a typewriter, a set of cards, or a blender. Three vocalists made strange and haunting sounds while someone shuffled cards into a microphone and another walked into the audience to give someone a present all in some way part of the score. The audience seemed to be shifting in their seats, trying very hard not to laugh, which would be inappropriate in a symphony hall. But the breaking point came when this conductor of the San Francisco Symphony used the blender to make a smoothie. He took a sip and then appeared satisfied. After that, all bets were off, with laughter tumbling down from the seats toward the stage and integrating itself into the piece. It wasn't just the concert that evening that Jenny O'Dell remembers so vividly. It was also the impact that the concert had on her attention. She writes, I walked out of the symphony hall down Grove Street to catch the Mooney and heard every sound with a new clarity. The cars, the footsteps, the wind, the electric buses. Actually, it, it wasn't so much that I heard these clearly as that I heard them at all. How was it, she wondered, that she could have lived there in that city for four years without having heard any of it before? Some things get our attention, while other things do not. What we pay attention to and what we do not pay attention to has consequences. It matters. There's a whole economy that commodifies, buys, and sells our attention. It makes a profit from our anxiety, envy, and distraction. It's what Jenny O'Dell calls an attention economy. Like any economy that acts like the air we breathe, we don't always notice it. Without our noticing, the information ecosystem in which we live, breathe, and have our being preys on our attention. In the short term, it may so distract us that we are kept from doing the things we want to do. In the longer term, the distractions may so accumulate to keep us from living the life we want to live. Or even worse, undermine our capacities to pay attention to the things we want to want. 
what are the things that we, disciples of the risen Jesus, want to want? Unfortunately, there's a difference between what we want and what we want to want. The difference is captured well, I think, by this Zen Buddhist saying, if something is boring after two minutes, try it for four. If still boring, then eight, then 16, then 32. Eventually one discovers that it is not boring at all. Though I only came upon this Zen saying recently, it's what I have been saying to my daughter all these years about sitting in church. Given the larger ecosystem which she has grown up in, it may be the sorry case that spending the Sabbath worshiping God has become the one time of the week that my teenage daughter spends time and attention not on what she chooses, not on what she wants, but on what, more than anything, as her mother, I hope she will someday want to want. It takes discipline. It takes sustained commitment to keep paying attention to something that has been there all along. Ever since Americans have become worried about the spread of the coronavirus, we have needed to pay new attention to aspects of our day-to-day -day lives that have always been around. We have needed to pay attention to the fact that we are habitually, constantly touching our faces that's why before we closed the church building, we had to post signs everywhere to remind ourselves not to touch our T-zone. Now that we are all encouraged to stay home, to work from home, to learn at home, to eat at home, we're paying attention with newfound appreciation to those essential workers who cannot stay home. Postal service workers, health care workers, emergency care workers, waste management workers. If we are not careful, we might not be able to disentangle ourselves from the attention economy enough to attend to the things we want to want to attend to. For example, in staying home, you may be spending more of your time in front of screens, and in doing so, you may find yourself prey to the fresh horrors throughout the day. In a strange reversal of roles, I've had to tell my retired parents to limit their television intake. Watching so much television news cannot be good for anyone, can it? To what are we paying our attention? Our attention is valuable. Even before the 24 news cycle and even before the internet were established, there has always been a cost. Perhaps it takes a crisis or calamity for us to become aware of the cost. It makes sense that in the, in the aftermath of some catastrophe, we would question our view of the world, the adequacy of our old frames of reference. It makes sense that when we are feeling lost, we would seek a new frame of reference. The disciples of Jesus were definitely lost. Jesus' crucifixion had so devastated them and their hopes for the redemption of Israel that all they could see was his death. So when the resurrected Jesus walked and talked with them, they didn't recognize him. They didn't feel any joy, that is, until later. It took them some time in his presence before they recognized him, but when they did, their hearts burned with joy. It may take some time for us too 
to recognize the resurrected Jesus. The thing about Jesus is that he doesn't force himself on us. He doesn't take part in the attention economy, buying and selling our attention. He doesn't publicize himself or put himself on any platforms. But he is always present for us, willing to walk and talk with us. Whether we pay attention to him or not, our resurrected Lord is always around, not just on a distant horizon, but here and now. Amen. Let us respond to the word proclaimed. As we join our voices, let us affirm our faith using the words from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to make an offering at this time. Your offering may be made by clicking on the Give to SPC button on the church website, 
or in an email sent this morning from the church, or by simply mailing in your offering by check. Please write your check to Swarthmore Presbyterian Church with Sunday offering indicated in the memo line. As it is our tradition, we hold five families in our prayers. We hold in our prayers this week, Linda Hefferman and Marty Spiegel, Brian and Carrie Hogue and their children, Graham, Amy, and Brendan, Chris and Winnie Host, Beth Jones, Erica and Chris Kaufman, and their children, Salvatore, Marco, Helena, and Christian. We also have two candles in our font. We mourn the loss of Joan Wright, who died Sunday, April 19. We hold her husband, Ken, and their extended family in our prayers. We mourn the loss of Nancy Fritz, who died Monday, April 20th, and we hold her children and the extended Fritz family in our prayers. Information on memorial services will be published when dates are set. Let us pray. Gracious God, creator of our world, creator of our lives, we find rest in a tapestry you have created. In a tapestry of how our lives are united to one another in spirit, we thank you for walking with us, for sitting with us. Through paths that lead to places that center us, through paths that go through valleys and mountains, we thank you, O oh Lord, for being present with us, even when we forget you are with us. For even when we forget, we thank you for the witnesses we have to your faithfulness and love for generation after generation. Thank you, God, for being with Sarah and Abraham as they traveled to places they did not choose, reminding us you are with us in this place we are in that we didn't choose. Thank you, God, for being with Naomi and Ruth, for their courage to stay steadfast to one another and to you, and the abundant harvest they found where they once was famine. Their witness reminds us how you are with us in our journey back to Bethlehem. As we hold to one another and to you, Thank you, God, for the gift of Mary, who anointed Jesus with costly perfume, reminding us that caring for the body of Christ is primary for us all. As we hold each other in prayer, hold each other's grief, stress, and anxiety, for your Holy Spirit unites us in love and peace. Journey with us, O oh God, in a tumult twists and turns of this coronavirus crisis and lead us to a place centered on your love, trust, promise, and new life that conquers all. We pray for your presence to be with your beloved who serve as medical professionals, as grocery workers, as immigrants who provide our food, as chaplains in hospitals. Pour out your presence and befriend those who grieve the loss of loved ones. For you, O oh Lord, we ask for rest in this season. As at times it feels like it's too much to take in, too much to process, we lift up our burdens to you, remembering the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. We lift up these prayers in the name of the one who created us. We lift up our gifts to the one who redeems and sustains us. For we respond to your love with our gifts you have given us, that they may be used to serve the needs of others. And may our gifts bring about hope and life. May we serve your will and show your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. bless you and keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace today and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you.